Okay, guys, good morning. Welcome back, and it's uh, about 9.55, so we have around four and a half minutes till we start. But thanks for being here again, and um, just get comfortable, and we just take a few minutes to be right with you. Hmm. Hope you're all having a good week as we get into um, heading towards spring break. Hi, good morning, Leo. Hey, Justin, Janice, welcome back, guys. Jason, good to see you. Hey there, Naaman and Devin, welcome back. Hey, Danielle. Hey there, Jerry, Alexis. Good to see everybody. <clears throat> hey, Celine, good morning. Mia. Oh yeah, it is the trade deadline. Who was getting talked about? Um, I heard that there was one guy that was kind of a little upset that he was a part of trade rumors. But yeah, we'll see how they shuffle the deck. Hey, Katan, Sheely. <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying to remember, I was just thinking about that. <clears throat> Hi, Brandon. Good to see you too. Magic trading Gordon to the Nuggets, okay. Celtics get Fournier from the Magic. A bunch of trades happening right now with the Magic. Busevich to the Bulls. So yeah, they're moving around. Interesting. At the end of the day, I don't think it's going to really change the balance of power too much. I think you're just going to see New Jersey and Los Angeles in the NBA Finals. <clears throat> but um, it depends, I guess, on how LeBron pulls up from his ankle thing, how Anthony Davis comes back. But I think that they're still the team to beat. Hi, Cameron, Kevin, Melanie. Welcome back, guys. <clears throat> Vucevic to the Bulls. A lot of the, uh, you know, there's a lot of Slavic people in the <laughs> in sports. So it's kind of funny, like one part of Europe, I guess, where we have a lot of uh, good athletes and stuff. So I don't know. I don't know if the genes came over to my side, but yeah, he'll be back quick. He always recovers fast. <clears throat> Still the best, I think. I think he should get the MVP. Well, I don't know. If he's injured a little bit, then it kind of hurts his MVP chances, but the fact that he only has four with his stellar career that he's had, I feel like he deserves a couple more, but I guess they like to sort of spread him around a little bit. <clears throat> I didn't think that last year it should have been Giannis at all, but you know, who am I to say? Welcome back, everyone. Good to see you guys, Sergio, Adrian, Ivan, Nathan. Okay, guys, well, it's 10 a.m., so let's just get things underway. Welcome back, and it's good to be with you. Um, thanks so much for taking the midterm last class period. So now that that's done, um, we move on to the next half of the class. I'll be grading those midterms throughout the whole spring break, and um, I'm going to try my best to just make sure they're ready 
and graded before we return. Um, but I'll be in touch with you as soon as I'm done, and then you can check on your grades for that. Um, obviously, this is our last class meeting before spring break, so we're just going to have one lecture today on a new topic, just starting in on, on this new topic, and then um, and then we go away for a little bit of time off to just kind of rest and recharge. So let's just um, jump right back into the schedule. Everything's on schedule in the in the calendar, so you can just see the topic and, and meeting topic um, by looking at the syllabus. Okay, well, we'll let's take stock at, of where we have been so far. Beginning the class, uh, it was all about the philosophy of religion, and so arguments about the question of whether God exists and attempts to try and prove this or to disprove those arguments um, or the nature of God, right? So we looked at that field of study in philosophy. Then we moved on to ethics, which has to do with morality and the concept of right and wrong, good and bad, what is permitted or what's not permitted, ethically speaking. Um, so we learned about the theories of John Stuart Mill, utilitarian ethics, the theories of Immanuel Kant, um, Kantian ethics. And then we tried to apply some of those ethical theories to the consideration of the moral dilemma or debate about whether we have an obligation to assist the global poor. And also, we looked at the trolley problem just before we finished with the first half of class, which tries to consider some puzzling intuitions that people have when they are treated to different cases involving killing as opposed to letting die. So now we continue, and we have another big topic in the class to start on today. So as I think I mentioned a few times before, there are several different specialties within philosophy, just like in science, how you have biology or chemistry or physics. Okay, in philosophy, we've already learned that there's at least two big subject areas. And now here's a third one, okay, to add to our knowledge that we're learning about. So today we start on this subject. It's called epistemology. Okay, so epistemology, this is going to be our focus for a few weeks. Once we get back from spring break, we'll still be looking at this for a little while. And um, it's a big, fancy-looking word, but what it really just means is this. It's the theoretical study of knowledge. So it's the study of knowledge. So knowledge is the main topic now. And so what is the study of knowledge? Well, we ask questions about it, like what even is it? What is knowledge? What does it mean? What is the definition of the term or concept knowledge. What does it take to have knowledge of something? And what do we know or not know according to the definition or analysis that we accept? So um, what we're interested in is the definition of knowledge and how it applies to our lives when we have it, when we don't have it. And if we could get a precise, precise breakdown and analysis of it, that's the goal of epistemology. Um, I'm a big fan of all the subjects in philosophy, whether it's metaphysics, ethics, philosophy of religion, and epistemology, but I would say this, just as we're starting on this topic, that I take a special interest in epistemology because of all the subjects in philosophy, this is the one that I guess I focused on the most in graduate school when I was getting my PhD. So people that are specialists in epistemology are called epistemologists, and I guess therefore I am an epistemologist because I published some work on this type of stuff. My advisor, Sven Berniker, He's, I believe, probably the world's greatest epistemologist that's alive today. So um, so I like this subject a lot, basically, and I, I take a specific interest in it, and I have a lot of background experience in it. So anyway, I'm just telling you that as a little bit of a context so that you know I'm, I'm coming to this topic in the class with even even more additional interest. In some okay, so epistemology, the knowledge. We are going to take a look at what the concept of knowledge is according to some writings in philosophy that have been around for a long time. You might be surprised to learn that the definition of knowledge was first described thousands of years ago by the writings of ancient Greek philosophers. Um, and so one thing that we're going to do is we're going to learn a little bit about these ancient Greek philosophers and we'll take, take on their view. What is knowledge and what writings have survived that tell us about the concept of knowledge? Okay, so philosophy is not a new thing. This is an ancient field. I know that in our class, the oldest writings that we've read are basically back to around 1077. That's the time of Anselm, the medieval period. But that's not even the beginning at all. Philosophy traces back thousands of years before that. Even in the Western world, we have ancient Greek philosophers that wrote 
hundreds of years before the Common Era, meaning, you know, 2,000 years ago is the start of the Common Era and the Julian calendar. Um, so people like Socrates and Plato lived 400 years or so before that. So we're talking about hundreds of years, centuries before the events described in the Bible in the time of Jesus Christ. So this is very old stuff. And the first written accounts of knowledge have survived from those times. So um, today, the author that we're going to look at is Plato, but we're also learning about his teacher, Socrates. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Socrates and Plato, because it's Plato's view on knowledge and Socrates' view on knowledge that we're going to start this part of the class off with. And good to see everybody there. I see you guys showing up to the meeting, so I appreciate it as always, especially on the last day before the break. You know, some people might have wanted to just get an early start on their holiday, so I appreciate you guys being with me for one more class period before we go. Okay, so um, <clears throat> these ancient Greeks, let's talk about them. Socrates and Plato. Socrates lived a long time ago, 469 to 399 BC, before the Common Era. So that's not 406, that's not the fifth century, like AD. We're talking about being born 469 years before year zero. That's why the date of his death is a smaller number than the year of his birth, because you know as he's getting older, it's like proceeding towards year zero. So we backdate these dates in the common era. Now, Plato is also from that same time period, but he's a little younger than Socrates, or at least in terms of when he was born. So Plato was born in 428 BC, and he lived until 347. So you can tell here that um, Socrates was 41 years old when Plato was born. You know, he was born in 469, 40 years pass, 41 years pass, now it's 428. So he's a couple generations older than Plato, and Plato survives on for like 50 years longer than, than Socrates does. He dies right at the turn, 399, and he makes it until 347. Okay, so um, Socrates, this is a name that maybe some of you guys have heard, Plato too. Because I think that um, even if you've never studied philosophy at all, these are just such big towering figures in the whole academy um, that probably most have heard their names somewhere, even if it's just in passing or through common knowledge or whatever. Most people have heard the names just because they're so well understood and they're historical figures. Socrates is widely regarded kind of as like the forefather of modern philosophy or of Western philosophy in general. I should not say modern because it's ancient, so let me correct that. He's considered widely the forefather of philosophy as it's practiced in the West. So he's like a founding figure, a big granddaddy type figure of the whole establishment of Western philosophy. So he's often, you know, a touchstone figure that we that we still talk about and we look to his to his ideas. Plato was a student of Socrates. So you can tell he's a little younger in terms of when he was born. He knew Socrates, he was a follower of Socrates, and um, he carried the torch forward after Socrates was gone of Greek knowledge and philosophy for the world. Um, so I need to tell you a little bit about the history of Socrates because I want to sort of give you some historical background knowledge about him. So what I'm about to tell you guys now is a little bit of a deviation from our ordinary method of talking about arguments. We will get to the arguments and the ideas in a bit. But for now, I just want to help you understand the, the real history of Socrates' life because it's kind of interesting and it sets the stage for our discussion here. When you study philosophy, right, intro to philosophy, that's what you're studying right now, I feel like it would be a dereliction of duty if you never learned something about Socrates and Plato because they're so you know, fundamentally important to the world of Western philosophy. So that's what we're learning now. Now, I'm going to give you a crash course on the history of Socrates' life. This is something I'm going to talk to you right now about in the next... 15 or 20 minutes, but obviously historians, scholars, they could spend, you know, entire careers working on the ideas of just Socrates or piecing together facts about his life. So what I'm telling you are just the basic bare bones details, but it's still interesting and it'll give you a good idea. Okay, so here's the deal. The time period is, ancient, well, the place is ancient Greece, and the time is 469 to 399 BC, the lifetime of Socrates. So imagine this, it's the town square of Athens. Athens, a major metropolitan city in Athens, in, in Greece at the time. Um, 
the town square would be like the equivalent of like our modern downtown area where a lot of people would gather, socialize, engage in trade, commerce. Um, you would see people perform and do entertainment stuff there. So it's like a big bustling downtown square, right? It's in the ancient world, obviously, so we don't have all the trappings of modernism and stuff, but it's a civilization. There's a lot of people there and they would engage communicate and do commerce in the town square. So Socrates was a citizen of Athens and he would set up in the town square himself. And Socrates developed a big reputation in Athens at the time for being a brilliant conversationalist. People thought of him as this witty and wise um, <clears throat> man who could talk to you about almost anything. And he would engage people in conversation from all different walks of life from people that were high up in the Athenian government or military, all the way down to just everyday folk. And he had this amazing skill of basically, through his critical question and answer back and forth dialogue, he would get people to change their minds about things a lot of times. So in a typical interaction with Socrates, someone will come into the discussion thinking they know something and having a view on something. And then by the time Socrates is done talking to them, just through this gentle process of questioning and answering, he leads them to a new way of looking at the situation, like they no longer claim they had the knowledge they thought they had, or they just have changed their mind and had their view flipped around 180. So like in some cases, like he talked to this powerful general, a member of the Greek military, and he asks the guy, what do you think is justice? And you know, the general, he's kind of got like a cynical view. So he says, oh, justice, it's just might makes right. It's all about power. So whoever controls power, they get to decide what justice is. It's nothing more than that. It's just power dynamics. And then by the time Socrates is done talking to the person through this kind of gentle questioning and answering process, they've had their mind completely reversed and flipped around. So the guy leaves the conversation saying, never mind, actually Socrates, now through our discussion, I realize that justice has much more to do with acting uh, according to virtue from a sense of honor. So he had this very impressive and powerful ability to engage people in intellectual discussion and the dialogue about any number of topics. What is justice? What is love? What is the idea of the good? And people would talk to him and they would have their minds open, have their views changed, have their perspectives enlarged. And so he became famous for that. People knew that if you go to the town square, there's this old guy Socrates in there and you can talk to him about stuff from all sorts of different topics. And it's very interesting and he might just open your mind about things. Okay, so that's kind of the reputation that he acquired in Athens. And because of that reputation, there was the following of like younger men that would go and listen to him just talk to people. And Plato, okay, now he enters the picture. He's one of those younger men that was just sitting back watching Socrates do his thing in the town square, taking notes and sort of studying from his knowledge and from his wit. Um, so Plato really, we owe him a lot of gratitude. Here's why. Well, Plato is a great philosopher in his own right and he has his own full set of ideas that are quite interesting. But without him, we would never have any of this information about Socrates because Socrates himself never ever wrote anything down. He never, he's not a writer, he's a talker, an orator. So the only reason that we have surviving stories of his life and times is because Plato wrote it down. Now Plato has a whole body of work that is obviously still in existence today that we're still studying in colleges and still talking about in the uh, university. Plato's writings are often called Plato's dialogues. And the reason for that is because if you read these Plato writings, Platonic writings, um, it's often written in almost like a play style format where you have characters that give lines and that just discuss as though it was the lines from a scene in a play. And often in the dialogues of Plato, Socrates is the main character who's speaking. So like Plato writes stuff with Socrates as the figure who's delivering the philosophical argument or insight. Um, okay, so look, scholars and historians debate to this day how much of the Plato, sorry, how much of the Socrates that appears in Plato's writings is the real historical Socrates and how much of it is somewhat an embellishment that was invented by Plato himself. Some people think that in some of these writings, the Socrates figure that is described in the pages is actually just a fictionalized version of Socrates who's being used by Plato as the kind of mouthpiece for his own thinking. But we know that Socrates was a real historical figure, so there's actually no doubt about that. There's even more confirmation for his existence than that of several other um, 
storied historical figures. Like, for example, there are court records from the time that he lived that show proof he existed. And there was also a playwright at the time whose name was Aristophanes. And uh, he wrote a play called The Clouds, where Socrates is one of the characters. And that shows, again, that he was well known to the people of Athens at the time that he lived. So anyway, we owe a debt of gratitude to Plato for even having the you know, insight to write these things down. And it's because of that that we still have knowledge of Socrates and the things that he said and did. Okay, so where I was was just to tell you that Socrates was this brilliant conversationalist that would engage people in dialogue and he had a following of young folks that would sit back and just listen to him do this. And they, they were inspired by Socrates. Why did these young guys like Socrates? Because they thought it was kind of cool that he would be willing to challenge tradition and received wisdom that they had got from their parents and from their elders and from other authority figures in Athenian society. They thought it was cool and different that Socrates would challenge the norms and he would, you know, speak in his own voice and be willing to push back on like general uh, assumptions that people had. So he was this inspiring intellectual figure to those young guys and that's why they followed him and liked to listen to him. In fact, let me give you a little piece of terminology really quick. There is this word that was coined because of how well-known Socrates' method of question and answer became. The word was invented to refer to it, and the word is from Greek, elenchus. Okay, so the word elenchus, E-L-E-N-C-H-U-S, that's just a little word that refers to Socrates' method of critical questioning and answering. So Socrates' method... of critical q and I'll just put it that way. So the Alenkis method was part of what was so inspiring and interesting to people that, that, that were witness to Socrates' methods. Um, <clears throat> today we sometimes call the Alenkis the Socratic method, that's the English way of describing it, named after Socrates, of course. Um, so you understand then, right, that he was a popular figure among some young people that were inspired by his example. But here's the thing, okay, plot thickens. Not everybody likes Socrates, though. In fact, some people high up in the Athenian government were skeptical and suspicious of him. They thought, we don't like what he's doing in the town square with the you know, philosophy stuff that he's practicing over there, all this Alenkis. We're worried about it. We think that he's actually going to um, corrupt and show bad influence to the youth because these young people really like him and they think he's awesome, but we're worried that they're going to start thinking too much outside of the box. And because they're following Socrates' example, they're going to start to be rebellious. They're going to stop listening to what their parents tell them. Maybe they're going to stop believing in the Greek gods, you know. And so they looked at Socrates not as this kind of valuable contribution to the intellectual life of Athens, but rather as a, as a threatening, subversive force that might corrupt the youth. So they made a decision. They said, we got to have him stop. We don't like it. So they said, we're going to send a messenger to Socrates telling him, that you have to stop doing philosophy in the town square. We don't like it. We think you're corrupting the youth. And then the youth is going to get out of control. So you need to stop. And if you don't stop, we're going to tell you straight up that we'll come back and we'll press charges against you and arrest you. So <clears throat> that happened. The messenger comes to Socrates and notifies him that the Athenian government does not want him to keep doing philosophy, that they think he's corrupting the youth, and that he has to stop. Or if he doesn't, they'll come back and press charges and arrest him. Now, Socrates... He's defiant, you know, in his view, and it's totally reasonable to have this view, he's not done anything wrong. He's not at all trying to corrupt the youth. He says, that's totally false. All I'm doing is engaging people in discussion, and they are the ones that come up with whatever views they have. And he says, I'm not trying to cause the youth to stop, you know, believing in the Greek gods, because I believe in them. You know, Socrates is devout, and he does the same pantheon of Greek gods. So he says... After they're gone, you know, he's like, I'm not going to stop doing philosophy. That's totally unjust. That's totally unreasonable. I've done nothing wrong. So I'm going to continue. So he continues doing it. And then they find that out and they do arrest him. So Socrates is arrested and put on trial. Now, I talked to you about Plato and all of his writings in which we learn about the life of Socrates. One of the Platonic dialogues is called the Apology. So just so that you know the name, one of Plato's writings, the Apology, that is the platonic writing that goes through the events of Socrates' trial. So if you ever did want to, and some of you may find it interesting, if you ever want to pursue more detailed or 
further studies in uh, ancient Greek philosophy, then you could obviously read any of these works. And I'm telling, I'm summarizing it for you, right? But the uh, the apology is very good and detailed, and it shows the full sequence of events of Socrates' trial. It's kind of an ironic title in a way because apology makes you think someone's saying they're sorry, but Socrates is not sorry; he's unapologetic. Um, so here's basically what happens at the trial. <clears throat> They put him up there and they say he's corrupting the youth. And so, you know, that's the charge. And um, the state, they're trying to impose the death penalty on him if, if he's found guilty. Now, <clears throat> back then, it's ancient Athens, and they did have a criminal justice system, and they did have a jury trial system. But there was a little difference between their method of jury trial and our contemporary American one. As you guys can probably know, in America, when we put someone on trial, we impanel a jury of like 12 people that are selected by the council of the both attorneys. Um, well, in ancient Athens, it wasn't just 12 people, basically, that were placed on the jury. They would have it be community-wide participation by all the eligible adult male citizens of Athens. So it would be like basically hundreds and hundreds of men from Athens that were of adult age, seated in like big auditorium gallery-style seating, listening to the trial. So when a trial happened, there would be widespread participation by members of the community. Okay, so... The trial happens and the arguments are given on both sides. Socrates defends himself and the state of Athens tries to prosecute Socrates. After the arguments on both sides were made, they always would give an opportunity in their system for the accused person to propose a counter penalty to whatever it was that the state had suggested as a penalty. So normally what would happen at this point, this would be the moment where the accused would go before the jury and, and court and basically appeal to their mercy and say, look, I'm not guilty, but if I was found guilty by all of you, then I would just humbly suggest that you reduce the penalty that the state has suggested to something lower. So in another case, imagine that someone was been accused of a crime and the state wanted to punish them if they were guilty with like 10 years of labor. Well, in such a case, maybe the accused would come at the end and say, okay, everyone, you heard the arguments and I'm not guilty, but if you found me guilty, I would humbly request that the, a better, more suited penalty to my crime would be five years of labor rather than 10. So, you know, the counter penalty thing would be the chance for the accused to try and finesse a suggested penalty in the event of a guilty verdict, but one that would be lower than whatever the state had requested. So you're supposed to kind of thread the needle of suggesting a penalty that's serious enough to show that you recognize some penalty might be considered appropriate, but not as stiff and heavy as what the state had given so that it would be more lenient on the person in case they were found guilty. So Socrates has his chance, therefore, at the end to give the counter penalty proposal. And he gets up before the whole jury in court and he says this. Okay, guys, so you've heard all the arguments and I'm telling you again, I'm not guilty. I've done nothing wrong. I have not corrupted the youth. No way am I trying to get them to believe there's no Greek gods. So that's all false. We all know that. But look, if you guys found me guilty anyway, They've suggested the death penalty, which is, of course, the heaviest penalty that anyone could give. And I don't think that that's the right penalty because, you know, it's beyond the nature of the accuse of, of whatever you think I'm doing wrong. So he says, if you wanted to give me something as a better penalty that's more appropriate to the so-called crime you're accusing me of, then here's what I've suggested. Let's not go with death because that's way too much. But if you found me guilty, uh, how about wait for it? Not death, but just free lunch for the rest of my whole life at the nice cafeteria of heroes. How about that? That sounds like the right punishment. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't think people are listening. You give a person a punishment when they do something wrong, right? But I'm telling you, I've done nothing wrong. And to the contrary, I'm doing something very good. And this is good for Athens. And it makes Athens better. So if you want to give me what I deserve, then I don't think I deserve death. I think I deserve free lunch for the whole rest of my life at the cafeteria, okay? That's the penalty, penalty that you should give me. Now, do you understand? That's not a penalty, right? That's a reward. Free lunch is nice, not bad at all. So also the cafeteria that he's talking about is not just any old cafeteria, but it's like reserved for like war heroes and noble citizens of Athens that are like uh, regarded as heroes and stuff. So he basically putting it in their face, like I'm not guilty. Not only am I not guilty, but I'm not even going to propose any penalty because I deserve a reward, if anything. Okay, so the jury goes away. They deliberate for a while. And then when they come back, they return to guilty verdict. So they found him guilty. 
And because of that guilty verdict, he now has been uh, sentenced to die, be executed. The method of execution would be that he's supposed to ingest poison. It's called hemlock poison. But there's a, one more little, perhaps one or two more little plot twists left. Okay, so he's been convicted. He's now sentenced to death. But in ancient Athens, there was a cultural superstition, kind of a belief they had, that if you had someone sentenced to be executed by the state, and there was a cargo ship or a boat out to sea doing a mission, that you're supposed to wait for the boat to return home safely before you do the execution. Why did they think this? Because they believed that uh, if you didn't do that, then maybe you would anger some of the Greek gods, and they would show their anger by causing the boat to sink out in the ocean. So there was actually a ship doing a little cargo venture at the time that he was found guilty. And that means that they said, we have to wait a while for the ship to come back because if we can't execute Socrates while it's out there, maybe that'll make the gods angry at us and sink the boat. So there was about a week of time until this boat would complete its journey back and get back safe to, to Athens. So that meant that he had to be held for a little while awaiting the return of the ship so that Athens could execute him in a way that they thought would not upset or anger the gods. So they placed him in this kind of dungeon-like chamber waiting as about a week passes to get the um, ship back. And in that interim period, what do you know, but late one night, deep, dark in the night, who comes in but it's these young guys, this group of young guys, including Plato. And they have, they've snuck in and they've got something to say to Socrates here. Now this is also written about in another one of Plato's writings. So if you want to look at this point, the story of the, the nighttime break-in and so on, then that's called the Crito. So anyway, Crito. <clears throat> so here's what happens. Plato and these other young guys that are followers of Socrates, fans of Socrates, they love him. They've come in and they say this to him. Hey, Socrates, come over here. Okay, look, got to be quiet. It's late, but we bribed some of these guards and we snuck down here. We've come here for one basic, very clear reason. We're trying to break you out of here, Socrates. Let's go. Let's get out of here because we know it's not right. You know it's not right, and everyone else does too. This jury's verdict and this whole court proceeding is a sham. This is just a total witch hunt against you. You've done nothing wrong. It's a it's an atrocity for you to be facing the death penalty just for doing philosophy and improving the life and quality of life for all these people in Athens. So we brought these chariots. You see these horse-drawn chariots with us, and just come with us, and we're going to get you far away from Athens. We're going to, you know, uh, escape you far away, and then you can continue to do the, the same thing that you've done that you love. You can continue to practice philosophy, and you won't be executed by the state, which would be a grave injustice. So come on, let's go, Socrates. Time is short. Let's make a move. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let me just take a little moment and ask you a question as we pass through this narration. Uh, what do you think was Socrates' answer to their request or whatever? Does he go? Does he not go? If you had to guess, what would you think? And why? <clears throat> Golden opportunity to get out of the prison. Does he take it? <clears throat> what do you think? Okay, so Jerry's saying he doesn't go, right? And Kobe, same thing. And you know what, you guys, you're right. That's correct, actually. So I'll explain. Um... He says this to them. He says, all right, guys, look, I really do appreciate it that you brought these chariots and that you're willing to do this for me because I, I agree with you on all that. It is wrong. It's unjust. I don't deserve it. It's a miscarriage of justice, and it's fundamentally wrong. But, okay, he has a few reasons now that he says he's not going to leave. He says, first of all, come on, I'm 70 years old, 70 years old, and he says, I'm not trying to live as a fugitive of justice. So if I do that, I'm never going to really be in peace again i'm going to always be looking over my shoulder wondering am i going to get apprehended and you know um you know I'm, am, I, am i really prepared to live my life as a criminal fugitive of justice always worrying about apprehension and re-arrest he says no i don't want that also he says this if i do that i have to basically live in exile i can't stay in athens so i'm gonna to have to go to some other part of greece far away but i love athens and now he really makes that a point he says i love athens even though i don't agree with the verdict here, and I don't agree with the proceedings of justice in this example. I love Athens, and I'm a patriotic citizen of Athens. He's talking about how he served in the Athenian military when he was younger. He talks about how he had children in Athens, and how, you know, Athens has given him everything in his life, you know, his family, his friends, 
And so he doesn't want to be far away from Athens anyway. So he doesn't want to be forced to live as an exile. And then he also says, um, I believe in the immortality of the soul. So there's nothing that can be done to me that hurts me. If, if they execute me, then my soul just escapes to the heavenly forms where they'll be for eternity. So I don't worry about that. And then he finally also says this, just the principle of it. I love Athens and I don't want to disrespect their criminal justice system by breaking the law and escaping from a penalty. I mean, I don't agree with the exact penalty that I'm facing and it's not fair, but I don't want to live on the principle that when you don't agree with the outcome of the law, that then you just break the law. So he says, just on then pure principle, I'm going to stay here and take this penalty. And they try to plead with him. They come on and say, Socrates, let's go. That's really though, are you going to have to stay here? I mean, this is your chance. Let's go. And But he refuses to budge. And he says, no, for the reasons that I mentioned, I don't want to live in exile. I love Athens. Don't want to disrespect their courts and laws. And um, I believe my soul is immortal. So he says, I'm not leaving. So he doesn't leave. Then the ship finally makes its return in the next day or two. And uh, so now he's scheduled for his execution. He's executed by means of the, the poison. There's a famous painting of uh, Socrates called The Death of Socrates. And um, it's one of these old Renaissance classical pieces of art. And in the painting, you see him reclining on like a table, circled by this group of younger guys, including Plato there. And they're just kind of there to pay their respects as he's been executed. And in the pose in the painting, he's pointing his index finger up while he's lying back. And you know, it's art, right? So everything there is symbolic and it has some kind of me deeper meaning. What's the significance of this pose, the index finger pointed up? Uh, well, it could mean many things. It could be that he says there's truth to be pursued, the higher truth, keep going for it after I'm gone, or maybe up there into the heavens, my soul will now be with the heavenly forms. But anyway, that's how his life ends. And then from there, Plato kind of carries the torch forward and he establishes and founds the first institution of higher learning in the West, which is called Plato's Academy, uh, or simply the Academy. And um, at the Academy, which is like the ancient ancestor of like our modern university system, he has a student of his own that's a couple generations younger than him, and that's Aristotle. So then when Plato is a much older you know, teacher, and uh, he has the pupil, Aristotle, Aristotle then becomes, in his own right, one of the big heavy-hitting uh, famous figures of Greek philosophy of ancient Greece. And then later when he's older, he becomes a tutor to Alexander the Great, who then conquers a whole bunch of land throughout Europe and other parts of the world. And that further cements the legacy of the ancient Greeks and disseminates the doctrines further. And now here we are and it's 2021 and we're still out here talking about the life and the times of Socrates from thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, um, whenever I teach this just brief lesson on the life and death of Socrates and his trial, I always think it's interesting that he chose not to escape. Um, and I think in a weird way, even though it caused his life to end, obviously, it might have done more for his legacy to the future because it almost establishes him as like a martyr-like figure for the establishment of Western philosophy, right? He, it's like he died for the philosophy that he was doing. Um, and if he had escaped as a fugitive, then maybe his legacy would have been written differently, that he was just another common fugitive and a uh, you know, criminal. Um, but in this case, it seemed like he had the righteousness to, to see that his legacy would be enhanced by this. So that's Socrates. And to some extent, I told you a little bit about Plato. Now, we're going to learn today, or well, we'll get to it partially today and then may, may uh, bleed into the next meeting when we return. But Plato has a dialogue about the concept of knowledge called the Mino, and that's our assigned reading for today. This dialogue features Socrates in discussion with a Greek general named Mino, and that's why it's called the Mino. Mino and Socrates are talking about what knowledge is, and that's like the first written appearance of the discussion in, um, in the West. So we're gonna learn about the Mino, but before we jump into it, I actually have a couple of pieces of vocabulary that I need to first get clear with you, because to learn about epistemology, you need to have a couple of basic uh, fundamental vocabulary terms clear in your mind. So what we're talking now is it's going to be called epistemology vocabulary. And I'm going to talk to you about like maybe four or five terms that are key to, to going further now into this study of knowledge. So epistemology vocabulary. <clears throat> okay, so let us begin with this term proposition. OK, 
Okay, so proposition in the in the philosophic sense of the term or linguistic sense of the term is just the meaning of a sentence. Okay, so let me write that, but then I'll explain. Proposition, the meaning of a sentence. Okay, so now looking at that definition, at first you might be a bit confused, wondering, well, what is the difference between the sentence itself and the meaning of the sentence? Isn't the sentence just the meaning? Not exactly. And the reason for that is because you can have, in some cases, multiple sentences, like more than one, but they have the same propositional content, or in other words, simply they mean the same thing. So let me try and explain that by means of a quick example here. On the board, I'm now going to write two sentences, two different sentences. So let me just do that. First one here, it just says the snow is white. The snow is white. Now, side by side with that, I'm going to write another sentence. And this one says something in another language. It says, Der Schnee ist weiß. Okay. Now, I suppose probably many of you guys don't know any German. But even if you don't, just with your own you know, common sense, because English is, after all, a Germanic language, so there are certain similarities phonetically and otherwise grammatically. What do you think? We see that there's two sentences, but how many propositions do you believe those sentences are? How many propositions are on the board below this definition? Is it two? Is it one? Is it a different number? How many? How many propositions are written right here? There are two sentences, clearly, two different, like, you know, they're spelled differently, they sound different. But how many propositions, if you had to hazard a guess? That's a question for you. So let me see in the chat if you can give me my answer. Well, no, Jerry, there's two sentences, but there's not two propositions. Reconsider what you're saying. Think about why that's not right. Kobe, you got it. There's one proposition there. Yes, there's one proposition. And why is there one? Well, because der Schnee ist weiß just means the snow is white in German. You know, so it's not different information. It's not different content. It's the same content, just said differently with, you know, different phonetic sequence of sounds. And obviously that's the case with any number of different languages. I mean, I'm, you know, you could say the same thing in, um, in Spanish. How would that go? And my Spanish is kind of rusty. Uh, pero is blanco or something. Um, no, that'd be dog is white. Well, I don't know the word for snow in, in Spanish, but maybe some of you guys do. If so, you can understand that that's another sentence, but it would be the same proposition yet again. Even within one and the same language, you can have multiple sentences that convey the same content. Like if I tell you that um, I am your professor, you could also say the same thing with regard to changing the subject. So you are my student. Um, or I could say I am in the kitchen, right? And then instead I can make the, the kitchen the subject of the sentence. The kitchen is where I am, or the kitchen is where Dr. Vulich is at. That says the same information as Dr. Vulich is in the kitchen. So propositions are the things that the sentences convey or express. The proposition is the meaning itself. And this meaning is con conferred from one side to another by means of sounds and symbols. It's a very interesting and kind of trippy thing to think about when you think about language because the sounds that we're actually making here are not essential to the conveying of the meaning. And that is known because different sounds can convey the exact same meaning. And we can imagine, you know, different possible worlds, different timelines of world history were far different than all the alien sounds would have been the unit that was designated to describe facts and information. Okay, so... Proposition. I'm starting with that because it is propositions which are the objects of our knowledge. It is propositions which we either know or do not know. So take the proposition that the earth is round. You know, that's something that we know. Or take the proposition that, I don't know, um, Joe Biden is the president. This is a proposition that we know, and it's something that uh, we can take an attitude towards. So anyway, proposition, the meaning of a sentence, not to be confused with the sentence itself, because the sentence can be expressed in different forms and yet convey the same propositional content. Okay, so that's one piece of terminology. And we add to the vocabulary another piece now. 
I'm going through these terms in a particular order, a, a given order, because it's like the next term kind of utilizes some information from the previous one in its own definition. So there's a logical order here. The next one then is the word truth. Now I'll put the definition up there and we'll make sure that it's clear. But before I do that, I would like to just see any of you uh, try to just contemplate this and see if you could formulate an answer for me in the chat. What do you think it means to, for a proposition to be true? Like, you know, take the proposition that I am wearing glasses. It's true. But take the other proposition that I'm wearing a hat. That's not true. So what is the difference between a true proposition and one that is false? What is the difference maker? What gives a proposition the status of being true? Okay, good name. And you say something that is factual. That's very good. Yes. I like the way you put it because... A proposition is something that can be said or written, but whether it's true or not depends on the facts of reality. Okay, Kobe, something that is widely accepted as a fact. Now, here's the thing, though, Kobe, about your suggestion, and I just, it's a little gentle pushback so that I can correct one thing. You say widely accepted as fact, but there can be something that's true even if nobody knows about it or even if most people don't think that it's true. Okay, like sometimes there could be something that is a fact even though it's not widely known or known by anybody. Like, let me give you an example, okay? Um, suppose that someone goes missing and nobody knows what happened to them. Did they fall into the ocean accidentally? Did they kill themselves somewhere uh, or were they murdered? You don't know, let's just suppose. Like you're one of the victim's family members or friends and it's just a mystery. They just went, they disappeared. That happens, of course that happens. Now suppose that the truth is they were murdered and their body is buried somewhere deep in the desert and no one will ever find it but even the murderer has passed away since then. So there's not even one person on the planet Earth who has knowledge of where this body is, or even that it was a person that was murdered. Couldn't it still be true, even if nobody knows it? And even if maybe the family doesn't want to believe it, so no one would accept that as a fact. It could still be true, you understand? So whether a person accepts the thing that's true or not is separate from whether it actually just is true. You know, there are people that don't think, there's not many of them, but there's some people that don't think the planet is round, like they think it's flat. But those people, they have a just false belief. Yeah, so, so that's all I wanted to say, Kobe. Um, and the reason I say that is because you're, you're in good company. A lot of times whenever I ask that question, the first instinct that just any common sense person has is, oh, something you can back up with evidence, right? Something that you have reasonable evidence to prove. And yes, you need reasons and evidence to have a basis to think something's true. But even without the reasons and evidence, it's possible for something to be true before people discover it. You know, so like... Right now, there could be aliens out there somewhere in space. I don't know it, but if it's true, then it's just a fact, even though I don't know it, right? Now, if I ever get evidence of it, like if the Mars rover starts beaming back images or data that show little life forms on the surface of Mars, then it'll be out of the realm of speculation. And then I'll say, well, what I was just guessing or speculating about before, now I really have evidence that proves it. But it didn't become true when I got the evidence. It was already objectively a part of the universe waiting for someone to discover it, right? So truth has to do with facts. Now that we've got that discussion in place, I can put the definition here. So when truth happens, that's just when whatever the sentence says matches the facts of reality, okay? Okay, so this is sometimes called the correspondence theory of truth. Correspondence has to do with two things matching or, you know, being combined. And so this definition of truth says that a sentence or a proposition is true when whatever it says matches what's real. Okay, so in saying I'm wearing a watch, I'm not lying. I'm saying it, but it's also real. In saying I'm wearing a hat, that's just false. I say it, but in reality... There's no such thing. So statements, we can say whatever we want, but whether it's true or false depends on how it compares to reality in the real world. So if I told you that I was, you know, um, born in 1960, that's just not true. That's false information. That's not the real date and time when I was born. Um, sometimes when we report things that are true or sorry, when we report things that are false, we do it because we have been misinformed. 
In other cases, we do it intentionally because we're trying to misinform other people. But for the most part, we want to get to the truth because by definition of truth, if you have false beliefs, then you're out of touch with reality and you want to know what's really happening. But we're not done yet. A couple more vocabulary items still to come. So we've said what is proposition, um, the meaning of a sentence. We've said what is truth, when whatever the proposition says matches the facts. Next, we have the word belief. Okay, And like I said just before, to know what the word belief means, we had to first describe and define truth. Okay, now, Brandon, can two things that are contradictory to each other both be considered true? No, they cannot be. No, 100% no. So, for example, take the statement that I was born in 1960 and then the other statement, which is the contradiction of that, that I was not born in 1960. These cannot both be true. It cannot be that I was and also I was not. Take the statement that aliens exist in outer space. The opposite of that statement is that they do not exist. These cannot both be true because we cannot have a situation that would be illogical like they do and also don't exist. Now, the only exception to that, Brandon, if you really want to get into the technical science of it, it would be like quantum physics. Have you ever heard of like the double slit experiment or Schrodinger's cat? Some people say that the Schrodinger's cat type of thought experiment indicates that this cat is both dead and not dead in two different vectors of quantum reality. But usually we don't focus on the quantum level of reality when we describe the macroscopic facts that we're all familiar with. So with those very, very rare exceptions aside, Brandon, the law of non-contradiction holds in reality. And you know that because when something's true, you always assume that it's not the opposite thing that could also be true. Like, can I have a child and also not have a child? This is impossible. I mean, um, I, I can I be pregnant but also not pregnant? That's also impossible. So it's there's when a statement has a well-formed content, either it or its negation is true, but it can never be both. Okay, so that's good. Thanks a lot. Good question. So as we move on to the next. I have to ask you about the word belief. <clears throat> belief. So truth is when the sentence matches reality. What is a belief then? If I believe a sentence, put these pieces together, I think you can probably give me the definition just off of what we've already said in your common sense. So to believe a proposition is to think what about it? Like if a person believes that there's aliens out there, and then uh, they have a friend that says, I don't believe that. I, you know, God made us in his image, so he wouldn't have weird aliens outside the planet Earth. These two people don't agree on the statement that there's aliens. One says, I believe it. The other says, I do not believe it. So what's the difference between their two statuses? What does it mean to believe a sentence, to think what about it? Okay, Kobe, when someone thinks that the meaning of a sentence matches reality, correct. Or even just more briefly, when a person thinks that the sentence is true. That's right. So belief. Hmm. When a person thinks... that a sentence or proposition is true. So beliefs, the thing about beliefs is those are up to you. Those are, we could say, subjective. But truth itself is objective. Okay, so like um, <clears throat> when I say that beliefs are subjective, that just means that you're the one who decides basically what you believe, and your beliefs can be different from other people. Take even just the statement that God exists. You know, if you're a believer, you say, I think that's real and true. If you're a non-believer, you say, I don't think so. I don't think there's really any such thing as that. So one person thinks that in reality, there's such a thing. And the other person says no. Or take the two people that disagree about whether there's alien life. In regard to the statement, aliens exist, the one person says, I think it's true. You know, I think that that's a fact, not just an idea, but a fact. And the other person says, no, the existence of aliens, I don't think there's any such thing in the whole universe outside of the earth. So that person thinks the same statement doesn't reflect reality. Okay. And people disagree on things. People can disagree uh, as to policy is a border wall an effective um, immigration control method is uh, global warming, uh, a man-made phenomenon. Now, I don't want you guys to think that these are hugely doubtful, at least the second one about global warming. It's, it's certainly real, at least according to widespread scientific consensus. But you know, there's some people who refuse to believe it and um, they've got a different opinion. So, Two people can have different views, but they can't have their own facts, right? If one person thinks the world is flat and the other person thinks it is not, they can agree to disagree, but they cannot both be correct. It cannot be that the planet has the shape disk, but also the shape sphere. This is a physical impossibility when it comes to geometric shapes. So 
when pe two people disagree about something, at most only one can be correct. You know, they can't be both correct if they contradict each other's beliefs. So if I think, you know, that um, your girl, your girlfriend's cheating on you, and another person doesn't think so, we cannot both be correct. Okay. So in the end, with beliefs that we form, we want them to be true for the most part. You know, if you have a head full of false beliefs, then as I was saying just a moment ago, by definition of true and false. You're living out of touch with reality. You're, you're living in a fantasy world that doesn't have anything to do with real facts. So we want to be the kind of critical thinkers and skilled reasoners that can come to true conclusions. But, of course, we're fallible human beings, and so we'll never be perfect at it. We're all capable of forming false beliefs, sometimes even when we try very hard. You know, like a detective or a jury can try and find out the circumstances of guilt. And they can, in some cases, have a false conviction, even if the evidence seems to indicate that this party is the guilty individual. So what I'm trying to mention is that we're fallible and, you know, improving on the accuracy of our beliefs, having more true ones rather than false, improving that ratio, it's a good goal. But perfection is not necessarily the standard because, um, you know, unless you were God or something and incapable of error in judgment or perception, we all have to manage the fact that we can make such errors and we just do our best. What's the best way of coming to true conclusions? Following the evidence where it leads. And that kind of takes me to the next uh, piece of terminology here. So next we have to describe the word justification, okay? <clears throat> justification. So help me out if you could. What do you think this word refers to? And I'll help supply some ideas just by putting it in some sentences that you can reason away from. Like we say of people that their beliefs can be justified or unjustified. <clears throat> So what do you think it takes to have the status of having a justified belief? You say, I have justification for this belief. What is that as opposed to saying, I have no justification and my belief is not justified? What gives a belief justification? What is that, you think, or guess? <clears throat> Evidence that makes the meaning of the sentence true. Yeah, so basically that's right. It's... It's having good evidence or good reasons to support, to back up your argument or to your, back up your conclusion. Good, also correct, name it. So I'll put it here. Having good evidence to support one's belief. So that's justification, having good evidence. Um, suppose that the person says, you know, I thought the, my partner cheated on me. And they're like, no, I didn't. Come on, are you kidding? You're like, well, I mean, look, here, I've been I, sorry to say, but I snooped around on your phone, and I see all these messages that you've been sending to someone who I don't know, and they sound kind of romantic. That's evidence, isn't it, of cheating? Now, it might not be that that's the right explanation. Maybe they're planning some kind of surprise party for them, and they don't want them to know all these secret conversations. I don't know. but. In the end, if you have evidence, that's something to go from. It's something to say that raises the probability that the claim based on it is true. If you see, um, I don't know, like you're a forensic investigator and you're trying to determine the identity of a killer at a crime scene, you might go to the crime scene, I don't know, collect fingerprint data, um, blood spatter information. Maybe there's some footprints left there that are of characteristic silhouette that you can associate with the purchase of a shoe in the local area and then trace credit card records to an identity. But, you know, in the end, if you find all this evidence and then you make an accusation of, of guilt of some person, you can't just say, hey, they're guilty, but I just have a hunch and I have no basis to think that. You have to supply the evidence in court and try and show that to a reasonable person, this makes solid evidence, evidential case that the person is guilty. And of course, you know, the defense attorney would try the opposite. They'd try and show evidence in court that tends to exculpate or exonerate the person, maybe receipts that place them somewhere else at the same time and day. Or maybe they have witness testimony that gives evidence that their character is inconsistent with committing such an act. Uh, but it's not like we can just put people on trial, convict them, take away their freedom and say, I don't know, we just felt like doing it and we had no reasons. Now, that's about the courts. But in everyday life, too, we want to have evidence for things, right? If, if a package you ordered isn't there, you're now trying to figure out what happened. Was it stolen? Was there a problem with the delivery? Um, so you might install like a security camera and then you have evidence that it was taken if, you know, the package was there and then you saw the screen blocked out for a while, like someone covered it with their hand 
and the next thing you know, it's gone. You didn't see the act of theft, but you have pretty clear evidence that it was taken because of the other things you could piece together. So whether it's everyday life, personal interactions with people, stuff that we hear reported in media or um, online, we want to try and have justified beliefs. So justification adds credibility to what you think. Now, justification is not like it's always going to 100% of the time lead you to the truth. Sometimes we can have misleading evidence. Suppose that someone was framing that criminal or that, that accused criminal and they didn't do it at all. Uh, the evidence still can make it appear rational to assume that. So, you know, evidence takes us as far as giving us probable beliefs that are true, but in many cases, they cannot absolutely guarantee the truth of a claim. But evidence is the best we can do, so we got to try at least, you know, find justification. So now, just one last uh, epistemology vocabulary term, and then I'll be able to put some of these pieces together to give you the, the succinct definition of knowledge that, um, that these ancient Greeks used. So the last one is just this, and that is epistemic agent. So an epistemic agent, this word is just a technical term that refers to a, a being that is capable of having beliefs or knowledge, just even able to have those things. So a being that is able to have beliefs or knowledge. Okay, so it's an interesting thing to think about just being a human being like we are, or even just being a living thing, but among the living things, to be this very special and interesting living thing in human. Because, um, okay, you see this definition, epistemic agent, a thing, a, a being of whatever type that is able to have beliefs or knowledge. Well, let me ask an easy question, a real softball. This marker that I'm writing all the notes and stuff with, this expo marker right here, what do you think? Is this one of these epistemic agents based on that definition? Is this marker one of them? One of the things that's able to have beliefs or knowledge? A simple yes or no, what do you think? <clears throat> Definitely not, no, right. And I'm sure it's so obvious to anybody, but let's state the obvious. Why is it so clear that this is not an epistemic agent? This is not something that's forming beliefs or having knowledge about any topic at all. What's the basis for saying no? It is the right answer. And I think the answer and the reasoning behind it's easy. But let's just kind of just be really blunt. Why is it not an epistemic agent? It does not have a mind, it's an inanimate object, that's right, it's not a living thing. So to have the ability to have beliefs and knowledge, at a minimum you have to be a living thing, and you have to be the thing that can have perception. So you need to have a central nervous system and some perceptual organs or a brain or whatever. Um, so this is definitely not an epistemic agent, and thinking about that is kind of fascinating in my idea anyway, because this universe, just think about how big it is, Almost everything in it is not an epistemic agent. So it's very rare what we are. You know, it's in the big expanse of the space and time that we're living in, most things are just objects. They're just stuff. They're not thinking, they're not feeling, they're not perceiving, judging, or any of that. They have no point of view on anything. But what about us? Are you and I epistemic agents? Is that an easy question too? Let's see the answer. <clears throat> Yes, we definitely are, that's right. We are things that can form beliefs, that do form beliefs, and do have knowledge about a whole indefinite variety of topics. Human beings know about history. Human beings know about chemistry, physics, biology, how to build technology. We know how to build a microwave, how to split an atom, how to build a nuclear weapon. Um, we know how to build vaccines. So we have a lot of knowledge, and we're very interesting objects in this universe. Well, in a way, we're subjects, not just objects. So the topic of epistemology is fascinating in part because it's involved in the study of things like us that can have knowledge. It's interesting to study other things, but it's also interesting to study the kind of things that we are too. But on the topic, do you think there are other epistemic agents in the world that are not humans? Let me ask you that question. It's, an, it's a question of, of your own view. Do you think that there could be any non-human epistemic agents, things that are not human beings like us, homo sapiens, but that can also form beliefs and have knowledge? 
Any view of that? What do you think? Is it just us? Are we the only epistemic agents or is there something else too? Just give you a minute to think about it. <clears throat> oh, you're saying yes. So uh, is that a current yes in response to my new question? I kind of couldn't tell if the chat is still giving me yes to the question before. Okay, yeah, so there you go, Brandon. You're suggesting like dogs. Well, dogs, you really think it's just dogs? Like there's not any other animals? Uh, so essentially, right, non-human animals probably in many cases are also epistemic agents. But what can they form beliefs or knowledge about? Not the same detailed and in-depth information as us. So it's not like the dog knows that we're the third planet from the sun or that the atomic weight of helium is less than iron. But uh, they do know all kinds of things, right? Like, I mean, just from my own pets, they know when I'm about to feed them or they know when I'm coming home or when I'm about to leave or they know like um, when there's an object that could be a threat to them or when there's something that could be something of, of value to them, like a toy or a piece of food. So anyway, I'm just saying that lower animals have some at least rudimentary abilities to form beliefs and have knowledge, but they're not as highly intelligent as us. And so their knowledge is by comparison much more minimal. Brandon, no, but some animals to higher degrees, yes, that's true, right, yeah, so you guys raised these examples that are good, like, um, we started with dogs, but then I saw chimps, elephants, dolphins, some of those higher animals on the phylogenetic tree appear to have higher degrees of, like, natural intelligence, dolphins famously um, are highly communicative and social, same with the higher, uh, the great apes, um, but I wouldn't say it's only limited to them, I mean, look, even little bugs and stuff seem to have at least very fundamental knowledge, like about when something's a threat or when there's something that they could eat. Um, like ant colonies work cooperatively to build tunnels and they su support the survival of the uh, of the queen and all that stuff. So um, in the end, there are other epistemic agents perhaps that are living things that are non-human life forms. Outside the planet Earth, you know, all bets are off. It could just be that we're very lucky to even be on this one planet where there's life. Um, okay, so. Now, we have finally got ourselves to the point where we can state this overall definition of knowledge that was given by ancient Greeks. And it involves a couple of these pieces, but smashed together. So what is knowledge then? I'll tell you here for the first time. So knowledge, as described by those Greeks, and th that view remained stable and, and dominant for thousands of years, all the way up until 1963, when randomly this American philosopher, um, wrote a very powerful and short essay that basically challenged and overturned the consensus view of knowledge. So I'm telling you this is the definition of knowledge that, that held for thousands of years, and it did. But since 1963, there's been questions about whether it's fully accurate. Nonetheless, we're studying it, and here's what it says. Knowledge is justified true belief. That's it, justified true belief. So it's a combination of those three terms that we just discussed. So for you to have knowledge, all three of these pieces have to be in place. First of all, you have to think something's true. If you don't even believe it, then of course you don't know it, even if it is true. Okay, so like the earth is round. There are some, sorry to say, people out there that don't think that, they think it's flat. Not very many, it's not a widespread view, this is a fringe thing, so don't think that there's a lot of people in that community. But some folks do. And so that person that thinks it's flat, they don't know that it's round. They don't know it. Why? Because they violate the belief condition. They don't even think it's round. So if you don't think something's the case, then you don't know it. But thinking it's true isn't enough. It actually has to really be true and correct for you to even have a chance to have knowledge about it. Okay, so you have to have a belief and it's got to be right. Like it's, a, it's correct to the facts. But even that's not enough because if you're just guessing, then you didn't really know. Okay, like if I sit here right now and I just say, hey, I think there's aliens. I don't really know that. I could be right. I mean, it's not necessarily impossible, obviously, given the life that we have on this planet. But I don't know it. And what would make me someone that actually knows that instead of just guessing or speculating? It would be if I had better evidence that could really prove the case. So when you have all three of those parts, though, that's knowledge. When you think something's true, it is true. And then you have good reason and evidence to back it up. But again, if any one condition is not met, that's not knowledge. So let me try and make that somewhat commonsensical to you by just going through, I think, a pretty helpful example, which is the example of taking like a multiple choice test. 
Okay, so say that you're taking a multiple choice test in a history class, and the question on the exam was, list the date, list, or not list, but bubble the year that Columbus sailed to North America. And they gave you these four options. A, 1492. B, 1692. C, 1892. D, 2025. Okay, you see those four options, 14, 16, 1892, 2025. Question, when, when was Columbus sailing over to the New World? Okay, so let's suppose our student doesn't really know much about history and they didn't study. But one thing they can rule out is D because it's clearly in the future. So history can't be about what happened in the future um, or will happen in the future. So he's like, okay, I've got it down to A, B, and C, but I have no idea which one. 1492, 1692, 1892. Hmm. I guess 1692. I don't know. I'm 16. Maybe the person's like, that's my lucky number. I'm just going with B. Now, I have a question, guys. Simple answer. Did this student know the answer to the question on the test when they filled in B as their answer in response to the question, when did Columbus sail? B stood for 1692. Do they know the answer? Is that knowledge when they filled in B? <clears throat> yeah, it's not knowledge, correct. So tell me, if it, since it's not knowledge and we can agree on that, which condition has been violated here? Which one is wrong? Because they have a belief, they believe it's 1692. They did just guess, but it's not even just that they guessed Kobe, there's another more fundamental issue here. What's going wrong with their answer? The answer they gave is not what? <laughs> if you know the dates yourself, I don't know. <clears throat> well, there's that problem too, name it, but I mean, uh, can anybody tell me the correct answer? I think we're fundamentally overlooking just one very basic piece here. No, guys, I keep telling you, it's not about justification. It's Well, there's that problem too. We'll get to that in a moment. But I was focused on the primary thing that they didn't fill in the right bubble. It's 1492. They filled in 1692. So that's not knowledge because it's the wrong answer. Okay. Now, if truth was not a condition of knowledge, then the professor would just say, well, it's the wrong answer, but it's still knowledge because everything's knowledge. Whether it's true or false, we just credit everything as knowledge. But no, we don't do that. You get credited for knowing something when the belief that you have got is actually correct. So if I think that the Earth is a fifth planet from the Sun, I can't know that because that is just not true. Okay, so like it's ruled out from being knowledge when it's fake and false, even if I thought that it was true. So that answer cannot be given credit for knowledge and I hope we can very well understand that because it's not the correct answer, it's not the true answer. Now let me change the case just a little bit to get to the other thing that some of you were mentioning here. Take our student again and suppose they eliminate D like I said, because it's in the future. And now they've narrowed it to 14, 16, and 18, 92. But suppose this student, 14 is their favorite number. And they're like, I have no idea, but since I like 14 and whatever, I'm just going to bubble bubble A. Now that person got the right answer, okay, but they didn't really know it. And why doesn't that student have knowledge? What's the difference between that student who guessed the right answer and another student who filled in the right answer full of information about why it's the right answer? What's the condition that's not being satisfied here in our second example. Because now we have the right answer, okay? So the truth is actually there. And at least in the moment that they filled it in, even though it was just based on a total guess, they had the right belief. But what are they missing? That's right, justification is not there. So when does somebody actually know their stuff? When they could tell you why it's the right answer. When they could say, well, look, the date of Columbus's birth was 14, blah, blah, blah. They give you specific information. And they could say, well, and the Cardinal of Spain at the time was this person and their you know, tenure extended between these dates. So we all know that it couldn't possibly have been the other three, you know, outcomes. That person, when they fill it in, that knows all the information as to why it's the right answer, they would fill it in the right way a hundred out of a hundred times, because it's not a guess. The other person kind of got lucky because their guess aligned with the correct information. But really having knowledge is not the same thing as having a lucky guess. Okay, like if I'm just guessing right now that there is an even number of citizens of California I haven't looked at the census, I don't know the data, so I'm just guessing, but I have a 50% chance of being correct. So suppose that by chance, my belief that it's an even number of citizens in this state is true. I don't really know it though, unless I actually look at the data and then see that it's a number divisible by two. And then I could say after that, well, I've looked at evidence and that gives me a basis to have this belief that is true. But just a lucky guess or hunch cannot be claimed as knowledge. If somebody says to their partner, hey, you're cheating on me, but they have no evidence behind it, 
that even if the person is cheating, they don't really know it because they don't have any uh, reasons to think that. Okay. So again, I can give you more examples along the same lines. Take a juror into the court walks, the defendant that's being accused of a crime. Let's say this juror has a bias against people that look like that individual. And so they say, Hey, you with that color skin or whatever, I believe you're guilty. I don't even have to listen to the arguments. Now suppose the person really is guilty, but they have not listened to any evidence in the court. They just pre prejudged the guilt on the basis of their appearance. That juror, maybe when they vote guilty, had the right verdict, but they didn't really know it because it wasn't founded on evidence. Okay, it was based on their prejudice. So anyways, knowledge actually requires all these pieces to come together. And sometimes people like metaphors, right? Take this metaphor. Suppose that to have a cake, you had to have flour, water, and sugar. Now in reality, I believe there's probably a couple of more ingredients, but let's just pretend those are the three ingredients that need to be there for a cake. Each ingredient is necessary, but without the others in combination, you don't have enough for the cake. So like water, you need it, but if that's all you have, I tell you this bottle of water, this bucket of water is not gonna turn into a cake by itself, right? Same with the flour. Flour, one thing you need there. But without being supplemented by the water and the sugar, it's not going to form the cake. So in this sense, we can consider these to be like the three ingredients that bake the cake of knowledge. Each one is a necessary essential ingredient. But if it's not combined with the others, the, they won't be enough to form the whole thing. So that's the ancient Greek account of knowledge, justified true belief. And um, if you have a belief, which is true and is based on good evidence, that's something that you know. Um, this definition or concept remained solid and stable for, like I said, thousands of years. And then in 1963, this guy Edmund Gettier, an American philosopher, completely opened a can of worms by showing through some simple examples that this definition is not quite perfect and that there are some cases where a person can have a justified true belief and still not have knowledge. So after Gettier in 1963, we're all in a bit of a pickle, wondering how to reestablish the right definition of knowledge which so far we've not exactly been able to do, but we'll get into that more when we return on the Tuesday after the holiday spring break, rather. Um, <clears throat> so we got through most of what I wanted to talk with you guys about today. There's just a few little elements of Plato's writing in the Mino that I still want to finish with. So when we come back after you know our, our spring break, I'll begin with uh, about 15 or 20 minutes on the Mino, and then we'll transition from there into the work of Gettier. So you'll, you'll, we'll finish out this discussion of the Greek definition of knowledge, and then we'll back that up afterwards with um, the criticism that Edmund Gettier wrote about in the 60s. So that's our plan, and uh, you know we're low on time now, so I don't wanna try to cram in a whole bunch of stuff on Mino with just less than two minutes. So let me see if everyone's good. If you're good to go, then I guess I'll just wish you a good spring break. And um, I'll be in touch over spring break as I'm finishing grading off the midterms. And you can check with me once those are done uh, through email. But let me know, are we all right? Just checking in with you guys one more time before we close for today. <clears throat> Thank you guys, okay, perfect. Just waiting for a minute to see your reactions then. Thanks again. Um, have a great weekend and a spring break. Um, stay safe. Try to stay healthy. You know, a lot of people are probably traveling and doing certain things that might put them at risk. But if you've not been vaccinated, take your precautions if you can. Um, so anyways, then, thanks again. I'll be in touch with you guys. And until um, next time, have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye.